faculty, and my project is on bofedales and water scarcity in Chile's Atacama Desert. Um, and we're lucky that uh, Talia actually gave a great uh, background to bofedales, um, which I will continue to build on. Uh, and I will be based at the Instituto de Arqueología y Antropología, which is in San Pedro de Atacama, um, at the Universidad Católica del Norte. And so today I'm just going to first give a brief uh, historical and ecological background um, uh, that's informing my project. And then I will talk a little bit about the research questions I'm going to be focusing on, as well as some of the theory and methods I'll be using. And finally, I'll talk briefly about uh, some of the broader implications of this work. Um, but first, I just want to acknowledge the lead researchers uh, on this project. First, Dr. Prieto, who is able to be here today. Um, who is my advisor. He's a professor of geography at the Institute, um, and he's been enormously helpful so far. And additionally, Dr. Karina Yeager, who is a professor focusing primarily on climate change impacts and water scarcity at the School of Marine and Atmospheric Sciences at Stony Brook University in New York. So the Atacama Desert, as you can see from this map, is located uh, in the northern part of Chile, but it also extends a little bit into Peru, Bolivia, and Argentina. And it's the driest nonpolar desert in the world. Uh, so it has an average rainfall of about 15 millimeters, but in areas, many areas, it's much less than that. Uh, it could be even as little as one millimeter or less of rain. And in this little blue circle is San Pedro de Atacama, where I will be based. So despite the fact that this is a very arid region, um, the Aymara people, which is the sort of name for the indigenous nation that's um, native to this region, uh, have been cultivating crops and um, herding animals, raising livestock for uh, thousands of years. And so one of the ways they've been able to do this is through the management of bofedales, which are, um, as Talia explained, these there's, there's really no precise definition for them in English, in English, but they are essentially high altitude peatlands. And um, as Talia mentioned, they are have a higher moisture than the surrounding area, so they're able to support vegetation that you can't find anywhere else in the Atacama Desert. And additionally, they're vital for raising sheep, goats, and especially llama and alpaca. And one thing that's an important thing to note is that the majority of these bofedales are actually created and managed by Aymara people. And so they are uh, created through a form of irrigation that has been going on for thousands of years. And this irrigation doesn't really resemble what you might think of when you think of uh, uh, industrial agricultural irrigation methods that we might be familiar with. It doesn't involve necessarily pipes or sprinkler systems. Rather, it's a form of, uh, of irrigation that to an outsider coming in uh, might not be even recognizable as something managed by humans. Um, so in addition to this long-standing agricultural uh, practice, uh, in the Atacama Desert, uh, there's also a huge amount of copper mining. And the copper industry uh, has grown especially over the last uh, 150, 100 years, and to the point that in 2011, Chile produced about a third of total world copper production, and a majority of this was coming from the northern region. So copper is an industry that's uh, hugely economically important to Chile, but as Talia mentioned, it's also um, highly water intensive. And um, addition, as a number of people have touched on here, climate change is also impacting this region, contributing to water scarcity. So a number of, of studies have shown many different impacts of climate change that you can see here. But some of the most important for this project are that um, there has shown that climate change is contributing to an increased scarcity of water resources, and in addition to a decline in agricultural production. And many of these changes are, contributed, are um, projected to continue to intensify over the coming years and decades. Uh, and this is just one quote from uh, an interview or a participatory workshop group that Dr. Yeager did a few years ago with Aymara community members um, that shows the impact of climate change thus far. Quote, there used to be a lot of grass and pastures because it rained at the right time. Now they, the grasses, don't grow anymore. Some areas have temporarily dried up and there's insufficient food for livestock. So alongside the complexities of copper mining, agricultural, and climate change, um, 
There's an additional compl uh, complex factor that contributes to water management in the region, which is um, that in 1981, the Chilean state changed the way that uh, water is managed and distributed through a uh, water privatization policy. Now, I'm not going to go into all of the details of this policy, which I'm still learning about myself, but essentially what it means is that water remains a public property, but the state can grant private rights to individual users. And these rights are separate from land rights, and they can also be traded between users. And there was a uniform application of this policy across Chile, whether in a mountainous region or a desert region, whether in a region rich in water resources or a very arid region like the Atacama Desert. And one key thing to note is that this privatization occurred during the military dictatorship. So many people were not able to protest or to assert their water rights as this change was taking place. And this quote from an interview that Dr. Prieto did with an Aymara Shepherd really shows this. It says, quote, we were afraid. We were forced to privatize. The mayor came here and told us that if we did not privatize, the military would come and they would beat us with sticks. That is how they measured and privatized the way they wanted. And the way in which this privatization happened, as well as the policy itself, had a real impact on water distribution in the region. And one of the biggest impacts for Aymara shepherds was that water right allocations did not, in most cases, account for water used for irrigation of the Bofidales. So this map really illustrates the way that this happened. This is a map of Las Vegas, the Chu Chu, one area within the Atacama Desert. Um, and this map was used to help distribute water rights um, in this, under this new system. And so you can see that in this area, uh, it's a little bit blurry, but basically in this area, this is a sort of more densely populated area where uh, there was a lot of agricultural plots. And so you can see that the canal network and individual plots in this area of the map is very carefully mapped out. And this is areas where more traditional irrigation of agriculture was happening. So that water was accounted for so that under the new system, it could be distributed more or less according to how people had been using the water in the past. This area of the map, um, you can see, essentially looks empty. And this is an area where there were some of these high altitude peatlands similar to the Bofidales I was talking about earlier. And in this area, essentially in the mapping process, it was rewritten to appear as a natural area. There's no lines of irrigation in this area. And so because this irrigation was not accounted for in the mapping process, under the new system, the water was not provided to continue to irrigate these uh, both of the areas. So as you can see, there are a lot of complex factors contributing to water use and water scarcity in this area. Um, but some of the questions that I'm interested in and that others on this project have been looking at um, specifically relate to the Bofidales. So to what extent have the quality and the geographic range of Bofidales changed since 1981, since the water was privatized? What factors, including water privatization, use for copper mining, and climate change have contributed to these changes? And how have these shifts impacted local ecologies and social structures? So these even are fairly broad questions. And so in my research, I'm really going to narrow in over the coming months on how bofedales are defined and how they have been defined by those in power, especially since 1981. And so that will include um, those making policies in government as well as scientists who are researching bofedales and perhaps also those in industry working in bofedales. So I'll be looking at how bofedales have been defined and how have these um, definitions and policies impacted the health and geographic extent of Bofidales, because the way that Bofidales are defined, whether they are considered to be naturally forming, formed by humans, or some mix of the two, determines what kinds of policies are made around Bofidales, which in turn determine their health, their geographic extent, and the health of all of the people and ecologies that rely on Bofidales. And I'll additionally be with others thinking about and imagining ways in which Bofidales might be redefined in a way that acknowledges their social and ecological importance. So as you can see, the, there are many different um, uh, issues that are contributing to water scarcity and, and water dynamics in this region. And these issues are both, some of them are might be considered natural, such as aridity and vegetation coverage, and others are decidedly human, like power dynamics around the water privatization process 
as well as uh, practices in mining. And so the theoretical approach that this project is primarily based in and that I'll be using is one of political ecology. And this is an approach that allows us to look more comprehensively at different factors that are contributing to water scarcity in the region and understand them um, through a sort of multifaceted lens. It's an approach that rejects the dichotomy between what we would traditionally consider to be culture versus the environment, and instead interprets local water dynamics as a product of both social processes and biological and physical processes. And this is one quote from Jamie Linton's book, What is Water? The History of a Modern Abstraction, uh, that for me really uh, underscores this approach. It says, quote, every instance of water that has significance for us is saturated with the ideas, meanings, values, and potentials that we have conferred upon it. So the methodology that's being used in this project that I'm joining similarly allows for uh, questions to be examined through multiple lenses by using both scientific methods, mainly coming from geology, as well as anthropological methods. So this includes both analysis of Landsat and other remote sensing data, um, as well as potentially some other scientific methods, taking cores, looking at um, other types of, of proxies, as well as some anthropological approaches that have included ethnographic interviews and participatory workshops. So in my project, I will be assisting with some of the, this data collection, especially around the remote sensing and geological side of things. Um, but additionally, I will be conducting a literature review of management policies and scientific definitions of both of Ellis, as I mentioned earlier. And I just want to very briefly touch on a little bit of the research that's already been done to show the way in which this multidisciplinary approach can tell a more full story of what's going on with the both of Ellis. So this here is a chart um, that basically shows some Landsat data. Um, it's sort of similar to some things that Talia was mentioning. It essentially is showing uh, the extent of vegetation coverage in one area in the Atacama Desert. And um, there are some flaws with this approach, but I'll sort of just say more or less what this chart is showing, which is that uh, the upper um, left-hand corner, you can see in this map, which was an uh, image taken in 1975, the green, which represents sort of vegetation coverage, is um, covering most of the area. But by 1985, which is on the um, upper right-hand side of the map, you can see, and this was a few years after water privatization occurred, you can see that vegetation coverage has decreased dramatically. And by 2009, which is the lower right-hand side of the map, you can see that vegetation coverage has decreased even more. So this type of information can give us sort of a bird's eye view and some way to quantify this change. But at the same time, there were a number, a number of people who were um, living on the ground as these changes occurred. And so hearing their stories can in some ways tell a more detailed and nuanced version of what happened. And so this is an example of a quote that Dr. Prieto, um, from an interview Dr. Prieto did with Anaimara Shepherd, uh, which says, quote, before the privatization, everything was green. Now there is no water and no animals. The DGA told them that the wetland has its own water. False. False. Let me tell you something. There, where we have our animals, we irrigate the wetland. Can I ask a really quick question? Yeah. Back on the slide where you have the Landsat imagery, can you orient us to where that image section is located with relation to like the rest of Chile? Yeah, I actually don't have the broader map. Uh, yeah, Dr. Pieta might be able to speak to But that. if you just... Show the first Image you had it. or the map? Oh, yeah. I think yeah. It was. yeah, so I can yeah you might probably be best. I'm just having trouble. No, the, uh, to, the Oh, the, the very. Yeah, 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 totally. Sorry to make you go back. No, no, no. It's all, <laughs> all good. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. So, this research site is exactly there. So, nice. this is the lower river basin. So, there. It's exactly there. Yeah, so really, it's a very, very yeah. small area. Yeah. 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 Cool. Awesome. Thanks. Great question. Thank you. Um, so, yeah. Um, yeah, the only other thing I wanted to touch on is just that, um, you know, of course, looking at these water issues just in this one area is com incredibly complex and, um, and is a really, really important task on its own. But for me, it also holds sort of a, a, a broader interest in that, um, you know, many of us have probably seen on the news that water scarcity and water resources is something that people are talking about all over the world right now for reasons including climate change, changing population density, uh, agricult uh, industrial agriculture, industrial extraction methods, and other reasons, 
Water is something that people are talking about in a whole lot of places, including in the United States. And so I'm really looking forward to learning more um, just in this one specific place about theories and methods and insights and learning things that I might be able to take with me um, to work on projects either continuing to work in Chile or in other places um, around these issues. And finally, I just want to acknowledge all of the people and institutions that have made this research possible. Um, and I'm happy to take questions now as well. So the map that you showed of the, the, the landside imagery, yeah. how much of the, uh, I, I noticed there wasn't much change between like the 1985 and I guess the 1990 measurement, Yeah. Uh, how much of the change would you say is due to like better resolution of the mm. measurement? Because the first one is just a huge block. I mean, yeah, that's interesting. That's something I'm not really an expert in the landside yeah. imagery, so, so yeah. So how, how, much, how much of the, uh, the definition could be explained by a, a better resolution of the measurements. Oh, well, that image is a 30 meters resolution, mm -hmm. right? Okay. So, and, and actually, at that scale, it's quite, it's quite okay. Um, right now, we can use better resolution, like 10 meters with the resolution, using other kind of satellites like Sentinel or even all the satellites that give us a, like a three meter resolution but the problem is that those satellites are new so we can go we can go back to the to the 80s sure. however 30 meters is okay yeah. Yeah, it's quite good. yeah i see yeah that there's not much change between 1985 yeah, so and 1991 yeah. for those that are not familiarized with that kind of technology one pixel of that uh photo it's um th uh, it's Equivalent? It's 30 meters. It's 30 meters. Equivalent to 30 meters? Yes. Uh -huh. 30 square meters. Yeah. 30 square. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so then you can calculate the whole area. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. mm -hmm. So, for example, if in this image there is 6.1 square kilometers, mm -hmm. here is 3 square kilometers. And how we can measure that? Because one pixel is 30 square meters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, so I'm sorry, I can't see the, the years up there. So yes. Just All right. Um, but you notice a significant decrease from the first photo on the upper left to the second. Yes. And then you notice sort of continuing of the same. But there's a huge wall of the difference in between the top two. What generated that? Well, so that does correspond to the, so that's 1975, 1985, and water was uh, privatized in um, 81. So that sort of does just span that policy change. So that's sort of one thing to note that um, in this policy change, uh, in many places, there was no longer sufficient water for Bofidales to be irrigated and managed in ways that they had been before. So that's sort of the hypothesis here. Um, but of course there are other things that are possibly contributing to this change, including climate change. Um, and so, but yeah, the fact that there is that huge change that just spans the time when water was privatized indicates that that is probably played a, played a role. Yeah. Yeah. And just a follow up mm -hmm. to your question, if we correlate the change to current climatic data, um, between 1975 and 1982, the precipitation was like quite normal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there is not a huge change in prep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the question is why despite the fact there is like a normal precipitation, the Bofedal in, in this case it's like has re reduced more more than 40% in only like five or six years. And that's uh, because that's why the local people is not irrigating anymore the Bofedal because uh, the Chilean dictatorship uh -huh. didn't recognize the fact that those Bofedales were irrigated. Consequently, they didn't give any water rights to the local community. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. My question is actually related to the like politics at play there. Um, so this was a privatization matter, and the was it seems like they did 
they did this with no consideration, right, like you mentioned, of the indigenous community and how they're using these the water resources. Was that done intentionally, or, or is there something in the land there or near there that they, are they trying to, like, move the population even? Or I, I'm just really curious about, you know, because a lot's at stake with land rights and land yeah, access. Yeah, that's too. a really great question, and actually, at least, well, in the, Dr. Prieto wrote a paper where he argues that it was that they did realize that the Bofedales were being irrigated and that this was sort of an intentional decision to kind of rewrite the landscape in order to divert some of those water uses to other, um, to sort of reduce the amount of water that was being allocated to these communities. So that's sort of, yeah, mm -hmm. that's my understanding, but you know, you might have more, Dr. Prieto, you might have more. Yeah, well, in the interviews, the people in charge of this process told me that they want to secure the water rights to the local community through the piratization, but then I found like secret archives in the <laughs> general water directory that say, that actually, say? we recognize that this bofedal is irrigated, however, it's almost impossible to measure how much water the bofedal required to be irrigated, so, you know, let's deny that the bofedal yeah. is irrigated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One more, just one yeah. more question, Okay, I, oh, well, I'm excited, obviously, about your project, <laughs> but um, I was wondering if in, like, defining the Bofedal, if you're going to be able to, like, interview community members that use them, if that's something that's in yeah. consideration, because I think that would yeah. be a really cool perspective. Yeah, I mean, certainly something I'm going to do is go back into the uh, interviews that have been done and okay. sort of look at those. I know that at this stage in time, conducting interviews is somewhat challenging because people have sort of an increased yeah. fear of talking yeah. to people, especially a foreigner, but yeah. um, especially with the presence of the mining companies yeah. and everything. Yeah. Um, so I'm not sure I'll have the chance to yeah. do additional interviews, uh -huh. but um, yeah, certainly that would be yeah. like a, I mean, that's certainly something, you know, I'm, I'm interested in, you know, yeah. learning and yeah. hearing perspectives. Yeah. Cool. Gleeman, but first I'd like to present Dinah Arnett, which I'm presenting